Okay, good morning. Can you hear me in the back? <clears throat> yeah, good, good. Sounds a little loud. Okay, um, boy, it really is loud. It's loud, isn't it? I can hear myself. Okay, any better or too, too low now? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, okay, let's keep it here then. It's too low? Okay. Let's try this. Better? Yeah, okay. I'll give you one more. Okay, there we go. All right. Lecture three. <clears throat> too loud. I can hear myself. Okay. 74 is the setting. I'll try 74. All right, so today we're going to talk more about the CUDA execution model. Um, we'll go through a couple of examples where we, they're non-trivial. Uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be looking at real data structures uh, with real dimensions. And we're going to try to map all this CUDA threading and blocks and this and that onto those real algorithms. Okay, and the idea here is, again, this is going to take multiple attempts, but it's yet another attempt to get us comfortable with this uh, way of thinking, okay, with, with uh, highly threaded execution. Um, with that in mind, let's just go over some of the preliminary stuff. So, um, Lab Zero, as you all know, was due yesterday, and I think a, a very high number of you were able to do it without too many issues. Some of you had issues, and you used Campus Wire pretty effectively to get through those issues. Okay, usually something wrong with the setup or the installation of Rye, but you all managed, I think most of you managed, which is good. Some of you still don't have a Rye profile because you just enrolled or some other thing. Okay, don't panic. Just make sure you let us know that you need a Rye profile or GitHub access, and we will get those things set up immediately. Okay. Um, again, Lab Zero was just a trial so that you and us can get all the, the, the whole system working. So hopefully at this point, um, we're all comfortable. Okay, the real stuff starts with lab one, which is due on Friday. Um, this one counts. Lab zero doesn't count as a check mark. Um, like I said, a trial balloon for us. Lab, zero, lab one counts due on Friday. It's not, again, there's not a lot of coding involved. Um, it's vector add, which is you know, the code we went through last, uh, last Thursday. And you'll essentially write it up, compile it, submit it on Rye, and then answer a few questions on Canvas, just like we did with Lab Zero. Okay. Um, if you're still having trouble getting access to Rye, which I hope zero of you are having that trouble, but if you are, uh, contact Andy, and he will... Get something set up for you quickly. Okay, anything that requires discussion on Lab Zero or Lab One? Yes? What are the deliverables? Like, what are, are you just grading the quiz for the lab? When you submit your code, we will grade your code. Okay. Okay, so when you do your lab, for Lab One, what you will do, by the way, every time you submit your code, we have a log of it, so we know that you're submitting, right? Because it goes to, the server and we store everything. So we know when you're submitting or when you're testing through Rye. For lab one and lab two and lab three and so on and so forth, what you'll do is you'll say, okay, this is the version I want to be graded. And you'll put a submit flag on the Rye command. It's not working yet, but it'll be working by Wednesday. And then that's the version we'll grade. Was that your question? Yeah. Yes. So, is it like, will any 
test cases be provided, or will some of them be provided, or not provided? Yeah, when, we, when you submit your code, we're running those test cases. So you're going to see the exact cases we run when we grade your code. Okay? There's no surprises. I don't think we're doing any uh, test sets that you aren't seeing. Okay? Although, we'll reserve the right to do that. Okay? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Can we submit the lab multiple times? And if we do, which version will be graded? Can you submit the lab multiple times? Sure. We'll grade the last one before the deadline. Okay. So we know when the deadline is. And you could submit after the deadline. It's fine. But we're just going to grade up until the deadline. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Is there an interactive mode that you can test your code? Unfortunately, you need to use Rye to get access to the GPU, unless you have your own GPU, NVIDIA GPU, in which case uh, there is uh, something on the wiki that tells you how to run everything locally. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, but, but if you don't, uh, then the first attempt would be submitted? No. I mean, you can run it something interactively on your own system. You have to use Rye to use our system. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, the, the, again, when you use Rye without the submit flag, right, you're testing your code. The last attempt, or whatever attempt, you use the submit flag. And at that point, we'll grade that version. Okay. Okay, any other questions? One more. Yes. For testing at home, can you make the, like, the data sets available? Sure. Can you post on Campus Wire and the TAs and I will try to coordinate that? Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Um, before we go here, I got a few questions that were asked about why this course is relevant because I'm a Python programmer. Do I really need to know CUDA uh, or any, anything like CUDA? Um, by the way, how many of you are Python programmers? I, I, this is, I hate asking surveys like this, but please raise your hand high because I want to get a sense of that's a lot less than I would have expected. And maybe some of you aren't raising your hand because you just don't feel like it, but maybe 40% of you raised your hand. Um, I think 100% of you should feel comfortable programming in Python. It's, it's really important because it's a language that, I mean, spans the gamut from prototyping to production. And I don't know that you can be effective in whatever role you do without, if your role is engineering, um, without being... Python literate. Um, I don't think I would have said this five years ago, but I'm saying it now and I really believe it. Uh, and I believe it because I've seen it in practice. Uh, people that are proficient in Python and you know, can test ideas out quickly uh, with Python tend to be very effective at trying, uh, just uh, uh, making their way through complex decisions. So, Anyway, I, it's sort of a side tangent, but you know it's important. And if you've been putting off getting to know Python, well, bump that up and spend some time doing that. Very, it's a very accessible language. Um, so you know, a couple of people asked me, well, you know, I like to program in Python. Is any of this relevant? Uh, and chances are very absolutely yes. Although you may not know it, and it's already happening. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're doing Python, you're using some kind of numerical package like NumPy or something more complex uh, like sklearn uh, where you're doing some kind of machine learning or PyTorch. Okay. So whether you're just a raw writing Python 
And doing complex math, like let's say linear algebra, which is oftentimes what you'll do with Python, the underlying support functions, let's say in NumPy, might actually be implemented with GPU accelerated uh, libraries. Okay, so even though you're not directly coding in CUDA, the code you're writing is actually executing through some kind of CUDA enhanced uh, uh, library or package. Because otherwise it would take for a long, it would take a long time to do a, let's say a large matrix inversion, if that's part of the calculation you're doing. Which it might be and you don't even know it because Python abstracts all that away. Okay, and nowadays, if you're a you know, hardcore Python programmer, you can use CUDA Python or the AMD version of CUDA Python or whatever, Intel's version of CUDA Python, where you can write Python code and then embed your own CUDA code or CUDA-like code to execute directly as we're doing here. Okay. And in fact, that CUDA code is the CUDA code we're writing in this course. So my point here is, A, first of all, I, I would hope that all of you get familiar with Python. It's, it's that important. And if you are familiar with Python and you're already doing things like deep learning using Python, chances are that you're already running GPU accelerated code somewhere down in the, in the guts of things. Okay. So now we're just giving you an understanding of what's happening down at that lower level. Make sense? Okay, well, let's carry on. Okay, so let's start here. We went through this last time. Right? This was our vector add kernel. And this is the vector add kernel you're going to be using for lab one. So you're going to need to be very familiar with this, like, right away. So let's see what it all is, right? So first of all, we've got this function here, vec add. So if I'm writing code, in this case C, C++ code, I can use the vec add function. And the vec add function is actually GPU accelerated because it's using a vector add kernel, which we define up there. So from a C, C++ perspective, cool, I've just got vector add. And if I'm going to use vector add, I provide A, B, which are floating point arrays, and then I provide C, which is where I'm going to put the result, and I provide an N, and the N is, well, what is the size of those vectors? Makes sense. It's simple linear algebra that I would expect everyone here to know. Okay? So I take those, I, I take those um, uh, uh, pointers, and I'm going to use those pointers, and I realize, boy, there's an error in the code. I hate that. Ignore the underscore Ds. If I had my laptop, I would fix it right now. But I'll fix this once I go back into my office. All right, so anyway, I've got A, B, and C. Um, and what I'm going to do is, based on the size of the vectors, I'm going to create dim grid and dim block. That is, I want to figure out how I'm going to organize the threads when I do the vector add kernel by taking the dim grid, which is how many blocks do I have in each dimension, and defining it to be, well, I'm going to take all my threads, and I'm going to put them 256 per block. So I'll take n, which is the size of the vector, and I'm going to chunk it into 256 thread, thread blocks. Now, why did I choose 256? I could have chosen anything, really. Uh, yeah, we all like powers of two, that's clear. But why 256 and not, why, why not 512? Why not uh, 1024? Why not 16? 
Those are all legitimate questions. We don't, you know, right now, I've just chosen it. By the end of the lecture, maybe the end of next lecture, we're going to get a good idea as to why I have to choose one value here. But for now, I picked 256. So I'm going to take n divided by 256, ceiling, which is just bump it up, and that's the number of thread blocks in the x dimension. In the y dimension, one. In the z dimension, one. So it's just a linear array of thread blocks, each block containing 256 threads. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Let me move on and then I'll ask if there's any questions. Now, each thread block, which is just a bundle of 256 threads, itself is organized into x, y, and z dimension. X dimension has 256 threads. Well, good. There's no, there's no more threads left for the, X, the Y and Z dimensions. So they're set to 1. So really what we have is a linear mapping of threads that we've just chunked into 256 chunks, blocks. Okay. So I take those two variables that I've created and I pass them into the execution configuration for the kernel. The grid over here and the block over here. And then I pass in the parameters to the kernel, which is, you know, should be just A and B and C. Omit the underscore D. Okay? So when we execute this, or when this gets executed, what's happening is the CUDA kernel executes. Okay? By the way, there's some code here that you will add that we didn't add that will do something important. What code is missing in this? Example, so that we can miss it, we can fit it on the slide. Raise your hand. Okay, some of you are seeing this, and some of you are like, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. Well, remember, let's drive it back to the fundamentals. I have A, I have B, I have C, I've got pointers to them. I'm going to call this CUDA kernel here that's going to start my kernel on the GPU. Okay. Looks nice, but um, the professor's saying that there's some code missing. And what is it? Someone raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, you need a temp variable to store C when the kernel sends the... Ah, uh, that's a partially correct answer. So he is saying, I need a temp variable to store C so when the kernel finishes... Yes, but it's not complete. I need a complete picture. Yeah. Complete answer. The two of you have completed the answer. So what she's saying is, well, I need to allocate some space on the device. I need to move A. I need to move B not move, but copy A, copy B onto the device, the GPU. The device needs to do its stuff. And when the device is done doing its stuff, I need to copy the result back, right? That's the complete thing that I think you were getting at. Okay, so all that code, by the way, memcop, CUDA memcopy, CUDA malloc, da 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 da. That'll be in your lab one. It's not here on the slide. Okay, but that's what's missing. Okay, so assuming that's all there and the slide compiles and let's get back to the main point here. So I've allocated, I'm sorry, I've, I've created the execution configuration with A and B, this little uh, number of blocks, number of threads, 
Now we go into our CUDA kernel. The, the GPU fires up and starts executing this code here. And, well, we know at this point, um, that this will now execute uh, on the GPU. And we know <coughs> exactly the number of uh, threads that will execute at this point. But let's, let's go and figure this out. Okay, so when we execute that code, what we have is uh, int i equal all that stuff, right? So what's happening is each thread is going to execute that code. So i will get calculated, and each thread will have a block index x, a block dimension x, and a thread index x, based on where that thread lies in which block and where within that block, okay? And from that, in fact, that combination is unique. If that combination wasn't unique, what would happen? Meaning the combination of block index and thread index. If it wasn't unique for each thread running on the GPU, and again, we've got many, many threads, if it wasn't unique, what would happen? It's an important question here, so let me make sure. I want to give everybody an opportunity to think about it. Yeah. You're using array and location which aren't correct. I want to, I want to get the correct answer. You've got the right thought, but it's not precise enough. Yeah. Okay, we'll take that. So two threads or more threads, right, if it's not unique, multiple threads that will try to do the exact same computation. Right, because the way they're doing anything different, remember, this is single program, multiple data. Every thread is running the same code. So they're all going to execute that same kernel. Well, if block index x and thread index x and block dimension x are the same, well, those threads for which they're the same will end up doing the same computation. Now, per se, maybe there's nothing wrong with that in this case, but it's just extra work. We don't really want that. So by design, absolutely by design. What will happen is when we execute a kernel, that combination will be unique for each thread. Okay, so when I calculate i, I'm guaranteed that the th that, that i will be unique amongst all the threads. And really what I'm doing, okay, this is another key point. What I am doing with that line of code is I am recreating the for loop in the sequential version. Right in the sequential version for i equals zero to n minus one, every time I go through that loop, I get a unique i. Well, I'm doing the same thing there, but I'm doing it in an instant through the CUDA magic. Okay, so there we go. Next is the actual work. It's the actual thing that's taking any time, well, we would like to think. And it's, what we're doing is we're taking A underscore D, in this case, plus B underscore D, sub I for both of those, and then storing it into C underscore D. And done. Okay. Yeah, there's this question of the if I less than N, which we've discussed, but we're going to come back to that in a moment. Is that creaking coming from me? Yeah. Sorry about that. I really messed up the microphone. Okay, let me try that. 
Can you still hear me in the back? Okay. Maybe it's less creaky now. Okay. Well, there we are. There we are. Um, any questions? Jeez. Yes. Yeah, imagine a thread being like a CPU thread. Right? When you have a CPU thread, what do you have? Memory, some hardware to execute the instructions. You've got a safe working environment. Right? And you can build computation off that environment. Same thing. We'll go into the details actually to some degree this in this lecture and more in others. Question. Yeah, that, that, I love that question. Okay. Uh, sorry about this creakiness. Um, so his question is, well, how does the thread actually get block index, block dimension, and thread ID? If I've got a bazillion threads, I've got to ensure that each one is unique. That can't be trivial. So the hardware of the CUDA device itself, We'll do that mapping, and it'll do it in an instant, it, meaning a few, a few uh, CPU, uh, GPU cycles. It's, it's able to do that. Okay. And if you ever take a hardware course, you might think about, that. well, how do I do that? And it turns out it's not that hard. Question in the back, yes. No, you're, yep. Great question. Hang on. Okay, we'll get right there. Yep. So his question was, well, what if n is a way more than we have hardware for? What will happen? Um, you know, we, we, you know we, will I hit some limit and will it generate an error? We'll come back to that. Okay. Right, so if n, so in his case, what if n were a very, very, very large number? And all I'm doing here is dividing it by 256. So this could be a very, very, very large number. And it turns out it's fine. The NVIDIA hardware, GPU hardware will handle it. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so I think we're good here. Let's, let's, so one thing I want to emphasize, we, as the programmer, have a choice to make. We've got a lot of choices to make. And we're going to go through some systems about which, you know, which, what are good choices and what are bad choices. But one of the fundamental choices we need to make when we design these algorithms is what does a thread do? Okay. So in the previous example, or in this example here, what is a thread doing? A thread is calculating one output element of the result. So each output element, one thread. Seems like a reasonable way to approach this problem. In fact, if I said, well, can we have two threads cooperate on generating one output element? It probably wouldn't make any sense to do that. How, uh, how would we even think about that, right? So if there's a C sub i, well, C sub, si sub i is calculated by taking A sub i and adding it to B sub i and generating that C sub i. So if I wanted to have two threads, I wouldn't, we wouldn't even really be able to approach it sensibly. But we could go the other direction. And we could say, what if one thread calculated two output elements? That code, it seems much more sensible. And so that's all part of our trade-off space. So here we go. Each thread processes two elements. So if we take a look at our code up there, we still need to calculate i 
And then what we're going to do is do this little cal cal computation up there where I first calculate C sub i using i, then I update i, and then I calculate a new C sub i. So just to draw your attention to it, I first calculate i, then I use that i to calculate C sub i. Then I update i somehow and then calculate a new C sub i. But I'm doing something a little interesting here. I mean, there's, an, again, a number of ways we can design this algorithm. The way I've designed it here is to say that, okay, I've got this thread block, thread block zero. First, it will calculate all these elements of C. C sub zero, C sub one, C sub two, C sub three, all the way to C sub 255. Right, that's what's happening with that first computation step. Then, all these threads do what? Yeah. By what? By a factor of one. Nope. And then so how am I Shifting. He's right. We're shifting by by how what uh, describe? Yes, width of one block, which is right. So the block dimension, if we see it here, um, is uh, two fifty six. Two fifty six threads. Okay. So I'm going to take this block. I'm going to add 256 to it, and I will be here. So thread 0 will now calculate C sub 256. Thread 1 will calculate C sub 257, 258, dot, 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 so on and so forth. Make sense? So now thread's calculating. So the thread has twice as much work to do than it did in the previous example. Now, sometimes that might make sense if the amount of computation is small and we want to coarsen the work that a thread does. One simple approach is to do that. Okay, I'm mentioning this because it needs to be part of our repertoire of how we approach a programming problem. Okay, question. So you are shifting the index by I could interleave each thread. We could have also decided that thread zero should calculate this one and this one. We could have done that as well. Is it because you want, you want them to access a continuous block? There's a lot of reasons we might have chosen this way. There's a lot of reasons we might have chosen your way. Okay. Again. We're going to see why one makes sense and why the other one may not make sense, okay, over time. It has to do with memory interleaving. Question. So the first one is identical to the, the, the JSON block, right? Because it's A or I, right? Well, in order to calculate, I think what you're asking is, are the outputs of one block the same as the other block? The, this computation is correct. I'm still calculating the full vector A plus the full vector B. Okay, so uh, the computation hasn't changed. We'll take one more question and then we'll move on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm now using fewer threads. Right? I'm trying to do uh, the same computation with half the number of threads, and therefore half the number of thread blocks. Maybe that's that, maybe that helps us. Okay, I don't. We're not yet ready to talk about the trade-offs about why we would do this, but rather 
want to plant in your mind that we can do this. In fact, we will do this. Okay, we need to think about how much work each thread will do. Okay, let's see some more complex examples. So if you remember from last time, we don't always have a linear array of threads or a linear array of thread blocks. We can have two dimensions, three dimensions to these things. And some of you were asking last time, why? Why does it matter? Let me show you. Remember our example, grayscale image convert, where I'm going to take a nice colorful picture, for whatever reason, convert it to grayscale. Okay. By the way, I mean, if at this point all of you understand the full power of the, you know, the very complex digital system, imaging system that, that's in our phones, um, and our phones are doing, you know, stuff like this all the time. In fact, every time you take a picture, uh, let's say it's a 10 megapixel image, there is an insane amount of computation happening in real time in an instant to generate all those samples of light into a very nice looking image. Right? And the amount of computation that happens from one generation of phone to the next just, you know, doubles easily. There's just so much happening. And one of those things is computations like this one. I mean, not every image is going to get converted to grayscale, but its color map is changing into something that looks more pleasing to your eye. That's just one of the filters that happens automatically. Okay, so we take the image and again, last time I told you, it was just an array, 2D array, of pixels, where each pixel is a red value, a green value, and a blue value for a color image. So what we want to do is we want to convert it so that the grays and the blue, I'm sorry, the greens, the blues, and the reds map to some value of gray between pure white and pure black. That computation is very much like the vector add in the sense that I'm just going to take each pixel, look at that pixel to generate the output. So this is just a 2D version of vector add. Kind of. Okay? So, but it's 2D, and that's where everything is different. So. This is what the picture looks like. The picture is a 2D array, right? Uh, it's got some rows, right? So for those of you who get confused by rows and columns, let's say these are the rows, they go this way. And these are the columns, they go that way. Okay, so we've got rows and columns, and that's what the, the, the picture is. And each of the elements here is a pixel. So what we want to do first and foremost is think about well, how do I take my threads and map them to this? And like we did with vector add, we need to think, well, how much work does a thread do? We'll keep it simple. In this case, a thread will operate on, it will generate one output pixel. Okay, so we'll keep it very simple. But of course, I could say a thread generates four output pixels or two output pixels. In this case, each thread does one unit of work. So what I need to do now is think about, well, how do I take this image and put blocks on it? And the block itself could be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. And the most sensible choice, just to kind of map to this, let's say we create a 16 by 16 block. So again, 256 threads, but organized as 16 by 16. So what's going to happen is, if I take that thread block 
and I map it onto that 2D grid that's the picture, is I'll get something like that. Okay, so thread block zero, thread block one, two, three, four, blah, 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 da, 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 da. Actually, it's thread block zero, zero, because I've got X dimension and Y dimension. So zero, 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 one, zero, two, zero, three, one, zero, so on and so forth. Now, based on the size of my picture, I may have some threads at the boundaries that don't really map onto the picture. Right? Just again, like with the vector add, sometimes we had threads that don't map onto the size of the input, right? Because the size of the input doesn't necessarily have to be a power of 2 or a factor of 16 in this case. Each dimension. So what I end up with is something that requires some extra work. So let's make a very concrete example. Let's say my picture is tiny. Uh, 76 pixels so that's 76 pixels in this dimension, number of columns, by 62. And I think it's 62 in that dimension, yes. So that's the size of my image. So when I map these 16 by 16 blocks onto it, I end up having this overhang. Okay. In fact, what I get is I've got these four regions. Region 1 is a good region where all my threads map nicely onto the original image. Right, so in this case I've got 1, 2, actually got four thread blocks in that dimension where the fourth thread block well, well thread block 0, 1, 2, and 3 those are great because they map into region 1 and I've got work to do but on region 4 I've got some threads well they're hanging off the edge and likewise in the other dimension I've got two thread blocks there were three thread blocks that lie directly in region one. They're good. But anything here, a little problematic because I've got some threads that really shouldn't be doing any work. And this is not a question of doing extra work that we don't have to. This is a question of, well, hey, don't generate any output because a, you might be reading input that's not valid, and B, you might be writing into memory locations that are not valid. So don't do it. Yes? I can't, I can't, unless I relay my image out, right? I think what you're talking about is what if I took my image and I mapped it so that everything was nice? Right? That's, I think, what you're saying. I could, but I don't want to move all that memory around. Yeah, but here, instead of having something that if we had just one byte, 62. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. So, actually, your, your point is, well, if I know my image size, I could create my thread blocks so that it always maps nicely into my image size, okay? But then what if somebody gave you a higher definition image? Then you have to rewrite your kernel, right? So we want our kernels to work across multiple sizes, if not all sizes we would expect, right? In which case we'll always run into this issue. So what do we do? It's not that it's impossible to deal with. It's just something that we need to take care of, and we will in a moment. By the way, how do we know that we're in the good region? 
Well, we know this because we can test. We know what the image size is. And we can always compute, well, what is my, what are my X and Y coordinates for each thread? What is my row and what is my column? And if my row is less than the height of the image, and my column is less than the width of the image, hey, then I'm good. I can calculate. If any one of those is wrong or false, then, hey, wait a minute, then I'm either in um, area two or area three or area four on the fringe, the boundary. Okay, so that's, a, just hang on to that. Okay, I need to make a short digression. Okay, and what I'm about to tell you is something that you probably learned back when you learned C or C++. Uh, and it's a piece of computation that's going to stay with you uh, through the rest of the semester. Okay, it's something you just got to get familiar and comfortable with. And it's the layout of multidimensional arrays in memory. Okay. So, for example, if I've got a matrix where I've got four rows and four columns, where conveniently we refer to this as, you know, let's say M01, M31, M whatever, right? So it's some kind of data structure, 2D data structure, where I refer to it by row, comma, column. Now, clearly in memory, when we put that 2D structure in memory, we have to pick a layout. And there's multiple ways of laying things out. Uh, and what we will use is a layout called row major layout, because that's what C and C++ use. And the idea is I take the rows of the matrix and I kind of put them in adjacent order. So the row all the elements of row zero first, then the elements of row one, then row two, and then row three. Okay, and then so on and so forth. So now I've got a linear mapping, I've taken that 2D structure and linearized it. And furthermore, what I can do is I can calculate the linear address of those elements so that if this were zero, this would be six, and that would be 11. And I can calculate that by using a very straightforward computation, which is I take the row, which is what is the row one, I multiply it by the width of that structure, that is the number of columns and then add to it its column, which, you know, let's say I pick this one, add one. So, and then it generates the index. So that computation right here, very simple. You need to be very comfortable with it. Yes, question? Because you still need to, then you have to assume a size, right? The only way for you to linearize it is if you knew how wide it was. If you don't know how wide it is, then you have to tile it. Okay, let me come back to that. Okay, let's, let's say you don't know how wide it is. How do you linearize it? So it's pre-linearized in that case. Like if I gave you an image and I said it was 100 by 300, you would need to, let's come back to that. Ask me afterwards, okay? Okay, so now we have all the pieces. So what we're gonna do is write this grayscale convert code. Okay, so I've got the image. Actually, I've got the output and for whatever reason, this is an unsigned car, which 
which is a byte. Each each output is each pixel is a byte pixel. Um, so I've got um, uh, that's the output. I've got the input, which is the RGB image, and I've got the width and the height. Okay, so it's two D array where I know the width and the height. So what I'm going to calculate first is for each thread, I want to know what row and what column that thread is working on. Right? So I'm going to calculate that using thread index x, block index x, and block dimension. Okay. And by the way, we're going to come back to this. So I'm going to skip over it for now. And we'll come back to how this is all done momentarily. Okay. And then likewise, row. So I calculate column and row just by using these indices. So I know what index x is. Uh, I know what index, the, what block it belongs to. I know how wide each block is, and so on and so forth. So by doing that, what I get is the original pixel coordinate. Let me go back a few slides. So if, for example, let's say we're kind of deep in the image here, and there's one thread that's working on that image, I'm calculating the column and the row coordinate for that pixel. And by knowing the column and the row, what I can do is I can find the original RGB pixel and calculate the row and the column for the result pixel. Right? So I can't do anything really until I know what these are, so I figure those things out first. And that's what those two lines of CUDA code are doing, right? Just helping me recreate what is the row and the column that this particular thread will operate on. Make sense? Okay. Um, any questions on that? Question. This is more of an implementation question, but can you pass in char star star instead and then do an index on row and a column instead of doing the calculation of row times width plus column? Yes. Yeah, you can make this simpler, but I'm doing it this way just to make it clear from a computation perspective. Okay, so there's that. Now, very next thing. I need to do that check. Right? What is that check doing? That's making sure that this particular thread is within the image. Right? Very simple, right? Is the column less than the width? Is a row less than the height? If both are true, and only if both are true, am I going to actually calculate the output? Okay, so then what I do is I calculate where the, out, where the output will go. So this is, again, mapping row and column into the memory location that will contain the output, the gray offset, we're calling it. Okay, so again, I know the row, I know the column. I can calculate the 2D, from the 2D, the one-dimensional linearized output. Okay. Now, what happens, sort of ignore this. That's just computing the grayscale. And we're using some funky data layout here, which I don't want you to get confused by. But just let it be known that what we're going to do is we're going to read some value of red, some value of blue, green, some value of blue, and calculate using some equation what the gray value should be. 
That's what the work of the thread is doing. Not important. It's not, it hasn't, that's not really what this example is about. Let's not worry about it. But I calculate where it's going by gray offset, and then I write it. And that's it. And the thread is done. Okay. So we have now used the 2D, kind of the 2D uh, thread structure, block structure, in order to simplify this particular code. Right? By the way, I mean, it's very simple, right? I mean, you can see it on one slide. And setting it up and executing all those threads, very simple as well. Make sense? Any questions? Yes. So I suppose the output value that you get in the gray image, it will be in one dimensional thing instead of a 2D gray image. The gray image. Well, I mean, gray image, well, I mean, all 2D arrays are 1D in memory anyways, right? I just don't know. I'm not explicitly calling it a 2D array in the case of the CUDA kernel, okay? So I'm treating it as a 1D array. But in order for me to treat it as a 1D array, I have to calculate its linearized location. So I'm treating it as a 1D array. Okay, but it's the same thing effectively. Okay, I, and I look at you and I think, yeah, I see some of you are getting it, but many of you are not. That's okay, we're gonna come back to these 2D examples over and over again. Okay, most of the course is 2D, except we'll throw a few 3Ds in there too. So those will get even more fun. Yeah? Uh, can I can I choose not to treat it, not to bracket the image in hyperbolic bracket, not to orientalize the image and and, and just and just treat and just treat it as a width multiplied by height multiplied by channel and this really the image. Yeah, 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 of of course. You you can do that. Okay. Uh, the, Problem is, C doesn't know explicitly what the dimensions of the array are, right? You are, you're, you're passing everything to C as a pointer, and we have to do that in CUDA. So in order for C to automatically, or C++ to automatically do the index calculations, you have to tell it anyways. So you will, one way or the other, have to do this row times width plus column. Okay, it has to do more with what C can do for you rather than anything else. Okay, let's keep moving along. Let's look at another example. This is kind of cooler. Okay, so let's say we've got an image. And what we want to do is take that image for whatever reason and make it blurry. So, blurry image of the pyramids. Uh, in this case, we use something called a blur kernel, and I'll explain that in a moment, where the size of the kernel was five. Okay, how do we make an Im image blurry? Anyone know? Some of you know, um, which is good. We can make an image blurry many, many different ways. One way is, okay, so if we have a pixel, let's say we have a pixel here. Okay, what I'm gonna do is calculate some output pixel where that output pixel is part of the blurry image. So what I'll do is I will look all around this pixel and kind of take the average of that, all these pixels in the square in order to generate the new value of X. It's a very simple blur. It doesn't look very good, but it's a very simple way to do a blur. Okay, so for example, each output pixel here, let's say this pixel in the original image, 
we're going to take a look at the neighboring pixels. In this case, the blur size is 1. So we're going to take a look at the neighboring 8 pixels around it. Compute their average. In fact, it may be 9 pixels. We'll just take all 9. We'll include this one. Take all 9 values, sum them up, divide by 9, and that is the value of this pixel. Okay, so now the, the work that the CUDA kernel is doing per thread uh, is kind of more interesting uh, rather than just a simple add or, you know, um, in the case of uh, uh, a vector add. So we're still going to use the same block structure, let's say. So 16 by 16 blocks on top of this image. But the computation involves looking at the original image in that square. By the way, this is what you'll be doing for, uh, M, uh, for lab uh, four. Except you'll do it in three dimensions, not two. Um, this is a general idea of something called a uh, convolution, image convolution. Okay, so you're, we're going to be doing a lot of convolutions. In fact, machine learning is convolutions and matrix multiplies, which, by the way, uh, are, are uh, lab three, no, lab two, three, four, and five. No, lab two, three, and four, convolutions and matrix multiplies. So you'll get lots and lots of examples of this. So if we're doing this, here's what the kernel looks like. So we're going to start, and it's going to look very similar. I want to calculate the column and the row that the thread will write as its output. In fact, that's going to be just a general pattern. Right at the beginning of the kernel, we want to know which where is the output going? So the column and row tell us where the output is going. So once I know where the output is going, I check to make sure that this is a valid output, meaning uh, I want to make sure column and row are within the image boundary. And then here's where it gets interesting. So what I'm going to do is there's a loop inside my kernel where, depending on my blur size, right, I could have a blur size of 1 or, um, or 2 or 3. Uh, and what I will do is I will do a nested loop that will go across the extent of that blur. And what I'm doing internally is just calculating the average. And that's really what the, the inner loop there is. We'll come back to that. There's some very interesting trickiness here that we need to deal with. And then once I've calculated um, the pixel value, what I will do is I will store the average the pixel value divided by the number of pixels into the output, which is row times w times column, right? It's just the output in the linearized output. So I do this, and it turns out I'll blur my image. That's all it takes. And in fact, not only will I have blurred my image, but I'll blur it in parallel, running on a GPU. Okay. But there's some trickiness. Let's talk about that trickiness. And it has to do with the fact that, well, I've got some pixels that are on the boundary that are going to, for example, this pixel here or that pixel there or that pixel there, where in order for me to calculate this value, I have to read some pixels that are not in the image. So what do I do? It's some decision I, I can make, and I suppose there's a lot of things we can decide to do. Um, examples. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, it's hard for me to hear. Would you mind? Beautiful examples. So what she said is, well, we could assume they're all white. We could assume they're all black. We could assume they're just copies of the boundaries. There's so many options. In fact, what is the right one? I don't know. Try it out and see what looks good. <laughs> right. Um, so the point is, we need to do something special. And what we do that's special depends on the thing we're trying to accomplish. Okay, but we can't just willy-nilly execute the code and expect it to work. So, in order to get this to work correctly, what we end up doing is we end up adding this statement, this if statement in our code, which is, is the current row, again, this is all part of the loop here, greater than negative one, meaning is it you know, not off to the left edge, is the current row less than the height and the current column greater than one, meaning it's not off the bottom, and so on and so forth. Right, so that's just making sure that the input I'm trying to read is a valid input. And if so, sum it up in increment pixels. So what's the strategy we're using here for those boundary pixels? What are we doing? Yeah? We're just ignoring them, right? So they're not part of the average that we will use. Make sense? By the way, what's a better way of doing a blur? Image blur. Yeah. A Gaussian filter. What is that? Good, that's a great answer. So it's, he called it a Gaussian blur. And if you imagine a Gaussian bell curve in three dimensions, just a nice looking bell curve. And you took that bell curve and you created a set of weights where the middle, because it's taller, has a higher weight, and the edges, because they're flatter, have lower weights. And you map them into a grid, like a three by three grid, or a five by five grid, or a seven by seven grid. Those weights become the amounts that you multiply each of these terms by. Yeah, that's gonna create a much nicer looking blur. And that, by the way, is a 2D convolution. So when we talk about lab four, that's what we're gonna be doing. Exactly that, except in three dimensions, not in two dimensions. Okay, more on that to come. Okay. So, good. We have about 10 minutes left, and now we're going to turn a corner and talk more about how this stuff executes and less about how we're coding it. So, any questions about the, the 2D examples that we've had so far? Okay, cool. So here we are, what do we have? We've got these kernels, which essentially are a sequence of threads. And again, the thing I keep saying, and I'll repeat it one more time, is it's a large number of threads, millions of threads, organized into hundreds of thousands of thread blocks. So lots of stuff. Now we gotta map it onto a GPU. And the GPU at the end of the day is the thing that does all the work. Okay. So how does this happen? So again, let me bring this back to our attention that all the threads are executing the very same code. They're executing the code that was on the previous page. They all execute the same thing. I'll say it in another way. There is some section of GPU memory that has all the instructions for the kernel. All the threads start executing with the same program counter. They execute the same code. There are not a million versions of the code. There is one 
one version of the code. Okay, that's the idea of single program, multiple data. Now the threads, okay, this is where I'm gonna say something new. The threads within the thread block, right, and I've got multiple thread blocks. Threads within the same thread block can share data. We haven't used that fact yet, but we will. And they can also synchronize. We haven't used that fact yet, but we will. So they can cooperate, those threads within the thread block. Threads outside of the thread blocks can cooperate, but it's much more expensive. And oftentimes we're gonna say that they don't cooperate. At least they don't cooperate on a fine grain. So really when we think about coding, Ideally, we want to keep all threads to be completely independent, but practically, the threads within the thread block are going to somehow do things together, and that's where things will be interesting. And these blocks, you know, we could have 100,000 of them, are going to execute in any arbitrary order. We don't know the order. In fact, we cannot, we cannot know the order. We don't want to know the order. Okay, so it could be that thread block 642 executes before thread block zero. Could happen. And your code has to be okay with that. Okay, so, and that's, it's purely that simple. Thread blocks execute any arbitrary order. Now, threads, on the other hand, execute in something that we're going to call warp order. And I'll get to that. Okay. So, now, if you look at the specs of a GPU, you're going to see something like this. And it looks way more complex than I want you to worry about right now. But what you will see if you look at the thread, if you look at the specs, like, for example, if you were to go and buy a, a, a NVIDIA GPU for your PC, you'll get one that has a compute capability. See that as the second row. You know, I think today you can get a GPU with nine or something. I don't, I don't really know. I don't keep track of that closely. Um, meaning it's got a certain set of specs. Okay. And one of those specs is the number of threads per thread block. In fact, that one has been fixed at a 1,024 for a, quite some time, right? So you can see that right here. You can see things like warp size. You can see things uh, like the maximum number of um, uh, Well, anyway, you get the point. They're all interesting in some way and they're all relevant to what we're going to Many of them are relevant to what we're going to do in this course. The point I'm making is, you don't know. You don't want to assume in your, co in your code that I've got a particular GPU that I'm going to execute on because you don't really know. I mean, we're using a fixed set of GPUs for this course. So every lab you do and the project you do is going to use um, uh, d d GPUs whatever the capabilities are. And you can read them. There's a way to find out what they are. But we're going to write code that's by and large independent of this. Okay. So let's keep that in mind. We're going to come back to this. So let's talk about the hardware a bit. So I've got these thread blocks. Okay. And the thread blocks are just a grouping of threads. And what's going to happen is each of these thread blocks is going to be mapped onto essentially a GPU core. Okay, those are called SMs or streaming multiprocessors. And each SM can hold a certain number of blocks. So for example, on Maxwell, which is a, a particular compute capability, each SM 
We can put 32 thread blocks, up to 32 thread blocks on it. Okay? Um, and for certain, um, for certain uh, new GPUs, these thread blocks can take up to 2,048 threads, which I guess is not what the previous slide said, but so be it. Okay, so what we're seeing here is some kind of hardware imposed limit on the number of threads, the number of blocks, dot, 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 that we're gonna see. Okay, so once I execute my code, what happens is all the blocks, by the way, we need to know exactly the number of blocks when we launch the thing, right? That's fixed. You can always calculate the number of blocks based on the execution configuration. So we know how many blocks there are. And they are sent off uh, to the GPU system. Each thread block is assigned to an SM. And we can get up to 32 of them per SM on the latest GPUs. Now, if there's any extra thread blocks, which I think was a question somebody asked earlier, uh, those thread blocks just wait until they have execution resources that they can map, okay? But once a thread block is, block is mapped, the threads on that thread block are eligible for concurrent execution. Okay, let's see how this works. And this is what I called warp scheduling before. Okay, so imagine I've got a block and the block has been mapped onto a physical resource, an SM. So I've got all these threads. In fact, let's say it's a large number of threads. Let's say it's 2048. Okay. What will happen is they will execute in what we call warp order, meaning the first 32 will be scheduled to be executed on the hardware. And they'll execute but at any point in time, another warp can come in, and then another warp, and another warp from another block, and so on and so forth. So when I think about the hardware for the GPU, what it's doing is, let's say this is the hardware here. I've got a bunch of execution resources, memories, register files, ALUs, and I've got all these blocks all these warps that, that are eligible for execution. So at any point in time, I can pick any of those warps and execute. And then at any point in time, I could stop that warp and pick another warp. Okay, so I've got lots of warps to choose from. And the, why would I do this? What's the rationale for doing that? Remember, a few lectures ago, I had said something. Yes? Good, but there's one critical difference. So what she said is when, when a warp, or when a thre thread block finishes, I can go find some other work very quickly. It's not so much about finishing. It's about stalling. So if one thread block, for whatever reason, one warp, for whatever reason, can't continue because it's waiting for a piece of memory from a distant memory, what we don't want to do is we don't want to idolize. That's not a word. We, we don't want to uh, make idle that hardware resource. We want to pick something else from some other, some other warp, other, other thread block or other warp, and execute it. So whenever there is a stall, for whatever reason, I find some other piece of work to do. Okay, make sense? And that is something that is a tenant of latency, not of throughput-oriented architecture. So I'm not really trying to minimize the amount of time it takes to execute a thread block, but rather I'm trying to keep the hardware as busy as possible. So if you know, this thread, this warp is stalled, I find another warp, I find another warp, and I just execute them one after the other 
picking something else when something previously couldn't make forward progress. Okay. Make sense? Any questions? One question. Yep. Do, do warps have priority? Do, do have warps have priority? Should warps have priority? No. It's a great question. And to make things simple, no, because we've just got a bunch of blocks. They're all parallel. I don't have to execute this block before that block. They're all parallel. So therefore, no priority. One more question, and then we'll stop. Yes. 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 In fact, we'll come to that. We'll pick it up from there on Thursday. OK, thank you. I think I am done. Can we uh, just meet outside?